Okay, we got five minutes. Show of hands, we're not starting. I know we've got uh, two and a half minutes yet. How many of you are doing Agile of some kind? Unqualified Agile, almost, wait, let me, all right, let's change that. Who is not doing Agile anything? Uh, ooh, and they're on the front row, look at that. Whether you're doing Agile or not, how many of you are doing retrospectives? Well, why are you here? <laughs> because our retrospectives suck. Ah, well, okay, that wasn't quite what I was looking for, but that will do. You want to learn more about retrospectives, right? Isn't that what re retrospectives are all about? <laughs> yes, maybe we should do a retrospective on the session when we get to the end. What do you think? Maybe. Maybe we should do retrospectives on everything. Maybe even on your own lives. How many do personal retrospectives? All right. Cool. All right, we still have people coming in and... My goal is to get through the presentation part early enough so that you feel you have the time to come up and look at the timeline. It's amazing to me that most people don't do a timeline. I think it's one of the most powerful retrospective exercises there is. And sometimes it's that agile projects don't know how to do them. So that's my goal is to finish early enough so that you have time to come up and read the cards on the floor and maybe add one of your own if you'd like. I think we have a couple of chairs up here in front if we could talk people into putting things on the floor. Well, all right, we'll just do the best we can. If you don't mind sitting on the floor, there are a, there's a little bit of space up here in front. I gave your chair away. Are you all right with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Is it against code? I mean, it would be in the U.S. We could have people sit on the floor in the middle. What do you? Okay. Get some, get, okay, you're bringing in some more chairs. Okay. All right, this is supposed to be a session about retrospectives, and I already did a little survey to find out how many of you are already doing agile development, and what I got was almost everybody. So now that we have about twice as many people, let me do that again. How many are not doing agile? Not? Yes? Okay. All right, we, wow, we've got four or five, okay. You, this really has a connection to Agile, but retrospectives have no connection to Agile. You can do a retrospective on anything. So if you're not doing Agile development, you should be able to learn some retrospective techniques and talk about why you would want to do a retrospective. In fact, it has a long history, and it has absolutely nothing originally to do with software. So if you're not doing Agile development, that's okay. But my purpose is to say what retrospectives should look like if you are doing Agile development. So that's the point of the talk is to make that connection. Wow. Okay. I, all right. If you don't get a chance to ask your question or uh, talk to me about retrospectives, you've got my email address. And I know that you have access to the slides. I've already sent the PDFs into the conference so you can download that. It's unfortunate that you don't have a copy in front of you so that you can take notes, but yes. My experience is that most people who think they are experienced retrospectives, people are not doing retrospectives. They are deluding themselves. I just didn't know if I should give up my seat, that's all. But remember that law of two feet. 
if it starts looking like, well, I already know all this, then you can vote. And it, that would be a good thing for the six or eight or ten people who are standing behind, and they would be happy to have you leave. So, <laughs> yeah. We shall see. Okay. All righty. Here's where it comes from for Agile folks. It's from the Agile Manifesto. Everyone knows the Agile Manifesto, yes? Right? Oh, yeah. And these are one of the principles. And it's one of the principles of the Agile Manifesto that, so let's look at this, at regular intervals. That means frequently you reflect, whoa, wait a minute, what is that? What does reflect mean? Give me a synonym for reflect. Yeah. It's thinking. It's thinking. There's nothing here necessarily about looking back. It's thinking. What a concept. I often have to explain to managers who don't know some of what goes on in Agile development about pair programming. And they say, well, Linda, what, what is that? You've got two people sitting in front of the same computer screen. One of them's typing. What's the other one doing? And I say, well, the other one is thinking. And the response, at least in the United States, is thinking. We don't have time for that. <laughs> we got to get this product out by June. And in a way, he's right that thinking does take time. Retrospectives take time. It's an investment. It does not come for free. So it says you got to do that regularly. You have to take time for thinking. And the goal is that you're going to think about how you're going to be more effective and then tune. What's that? Tuning. Any musicians? Tuning. Anybody play an instrument? What does that mean, tune? Yeah, there you have a standard, a standard pitch that you have to make sure you are in tune with. And unless you haven't played that instrument in a long time, it's a small. You have to, if it's a guitar, you have to make a small adjustment. I used to play harpsichord a long time ago, and if I didn't have a chance to practice, sometimes that tuning was major. But the implication here is that it is a small adjustment. So the message from Kent Beck originally about what they meant, those white males who gathered to create the Agile Manifesto, no women were invited. I, I bear no grudge for that. Not too much, anyway. Is that it was like driving a car. That's what Kent said. When you're going down the road, and I know that he's never driven in Bangalore, or he might have chosen a different <coughs> metaphor, because I think it's different here that while you're going down the road, you don't usually move out of the lane, like on that little three-wheeled thing I was in the other day. He just decided, I'm tired of this lane. I'm moving over in the other lane. And when we got over there, we were facing a bus who was coming right toward us. And I thought, oh, God, this is it. I know it. This is the end. He was thinking about a more regulated situation where you would stay in your lane and just make small, small adjustments 
have just tuned. So the idea is that you're going to stop frequently and examine by thinking, what are the things you can do so that you can be better? Is there anything here about dredging up everything that went wrong over the last iteration? Is there anything here? Do you see anything here about bad stuff? or problems, or, do you see anything? No. Anybody here who does retrospectives, do you notice that one of the things that can happen, maybe in your boring retrospectives, that you do occasionally spend time on problems, or what went wrong? Perhaps an inordinate amount of time? Anybody? Yes. 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 That's not the intent. It happens. I facilitate retrospectives as part of what I do, and I can see that teams who say they have been doing retrospectives immediately want to head down that road. They want to immediately ask the question, what went wrong? in the last iteration, or in the last release, or whatever the retrospective covers. And that's not the intent. So make a note of that, please. We used to do retrospectives back in the good old days. I worked on many, many, many large projects. I worked on the 777 airplane. I worked for a lot of defense projects, telecom weapons, and we call them post-mortems. Something about that word. It's Latin. Do you know what the translation is? Yes, post, after, mortem, after death. Because in the medical profession, not always, but in many cases, after death, there is a post-mortem to examine a dead body. So that's the image. Something laid out on a slab, cold, dead, and no matter what you learn, it sure can't help this guy. <laughs> it's too late. And most of the time what you did learn from that post-mortem got lost. It was documented and put somewhere and nobody ever looked at it again. Do you have that problem with your retrospective? that you create something and then nobody ever looks at it again? Aha, aha. So now there's a switch. In agility, we say we're not waiting until the body is cold and dead. We're going to do something like a little checkup. Just like you go in regularly to see your doctor and the doctor says, you know, I think maybe you need to lose a little weight, you need to start exercising, and it would be good if you would do those things while you're still alive. So the information from a retrospective is designed to help you while you're living so that you can make some small adjustments and do a better job just like you do for yourself. So at the personal level, because I'm advocating for personal retrospectives as well, you should be looking at your own life, periodically examining how to be more effective at a personal level, and then making some small adjustments while you're still alive and younger than 71, so that you have time 
to do something about it. So yes, it is a post-mortem in a way, but I sure like the name retrospectives. And that does not mean that you can't do a retrospectives at the end of the project. In fact, you should. You can do a retrospective at the end of each iteration. You can do a retrospective when there are surprises. You can do retrospectives when projects are canceled. You can do retrospectives when there's a new customer. It's not tied to end of iteration. You just want to make sure that it's a common practice. It's a ritual. And as humans, we love rituals. It helps us get through bad things. There is only one book on retrospectives. It was written by my good friend, Norm Kurth. Somebody in your company should have it. You can share the copies. And here's what he says. This is about learning. That matches up with the Agile Manifesto. You examine your life or your project, and then you make some small adjustments and it's about learning, not fault finding. So I mentioned that retrospectives are one of the things that I do as part of my consultancy. Why? Why would somebody either in another part of the United States or another part of the world give me a call or send me an email saying, hey, Linda, uh, why don't you come on over here and do a retrospective for us? Why would they do that? Why would they bring somebody else in? Why would they have me come all the way from Nashville, Tennessee to look at their project? Why would they do that? Well, I don't know why they are thinking. That's part of the problem, I think, here. What kind of project would you suppose this would be? When people call me up, is it because, wow, we just had a huge, tremendous success, and we want to know why things went so well. Uh, no. Yeah, it's more likely a disaster. And when the guy who called me up takes me aside when I arrive there, this is usually a pretty high-level guy who brought me in. What is he looking for? He is looking for what went wrong more specifically. What is he looking for? And yes, and yes, and it is a he. Every time, every single time it has been a he. He's looking for who's to blame. Who is it that I can say, aha, let's get rid of him. And then everyone else can feel, whew, okay. So that's unfortunately the driver behind a lot of retrospectives. You know, a few things went wrong. So not only are you focused on the problem, on the things that made you unhappy, but it's also whose fault was it? How many of you heard the stereotype presentation the other day? You start talking about them immediately. Well, it couldn't have been our team. It must have been those testers, those members of other teams, those business guys, those marketing and sales guys, those executives who made the decision to keep this project going. There must be somebody, some they, some them. Yeah. It's a very human thing. So that is not an appropriate activity for a retrospective. Not only the focus on the problem, but also the blaming. In fact, we will look closely at the prime directive, which specifies how you can even talk the vocabulary you use to talk about others so that you avoid that they, that labeling. I, I hate to have you down. I feel like you're, <laughs> are you okay? Okay. Learning, not fault-finding. 
There is a book on Agile retrospectives written by my good friends Esther Derby and Diana Larson. And it builds on that other book. So you really need the other one as a prerequisite. And they tailor it by saying, now that you're looking at shorter iterations, here are some suggestions for what the differences are. But if you don't know what the original book was about, then the differences really don't mean a whole lot to you. And again, your team or your company should have at least one copy. You can share it. So we've got project retrospectives. We've got agile retrospectives. And now Patrick Kua has come out with one. I think you can even download this. And Patrick is someone I met at the Retrospectives Facilitators Gathering. There are a group of us who are professional facilitators, and we meet once a year at some part of the world, and we share tips. What have we learned over the past year about the projects that we've seen, what works well in facilitating retrospectives? And so Patrick's kind of been an, uh, a little archaeologist, and he has collected information about those meetings. and. Here, if you can get that, okay, and again, if you don't, don't get it down, send me some email and I'll, I'll tell you where that link is. So you got three good sources if you want to read more information about retrospectives. I've written a lot of stuff about retrospectives, so you can also go to my website and click on articles, and underneath is a retrospectives. I don't know, does this work here? Do you know Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. Really? Wow, okay. And Christopher Robin. Yeah. yeah, okay. How cool is that? Who would have thought? He's got a different name in different countries. No, he's called Winnie the Pooh. Hmm. Well, I like this quote. Talks about Christopher Robin coming down the stairs carrying Edward Bear or Winnie the Pooh behind him. So the quote is, here's Edward Bear. Coming downstairs now, bump, 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 bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels there is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. Does that sound like any software projects you know? There must be a better way. But we have to have the time to stop bumping and think of it. So it does require a moment for reflection. It's not going to happen automatically. In fact, we'll talk about that myth. So here's why you do it. We have a myth that we believe that because we've had an experience, how many of you were in the talk about the experiment with the managers where they ran a scenario and they made some mistakes and then they did a little debrief and then they ran another scenario and they found that, oh my goodness, the managers made the same mistakes over again. And when I told you about that, were you thinking, oh, well, that's those people. <laughs> because we know, we know, because we're so smart and so logical that we learn, don't we? We learn from our experience. Yes. Yes, of course. All right, how many of you? have never made the same mistake twice. <laughs> so maybe, oh, you never have. <laughs> You've never made this. You have made the same mistake. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's never made the same mistake. That's oh, right. Oh, OK. I thought you were going to be an anomaly. I've never met anyone who has never made the same mistake. Sorry, I was probably not speaking clearly. Yeah. It's unfortunate that we have that tendency. So I really like this quote it's from James Fallows. He says, 
We want to believe that learning from experience is automatic. That there's something about our brain that pays attention to what we've just been through. And so that we learn from that. But unfortunately, what we get from experience is a lot of, well, I sort of translated this so it would fit software. It's like data. And we know that now we're surrounded by a lot of data. And that does not mean that we have any more knowledge. That is, it is not useful. We haven't really acquired that experience and translate it to something that's useful. So data, plenty of data, but it takes work. And that's really what goes on in a retrospective. It's an examination of the data and then a conversion to something useful that the team can apply or use so that it becomes part of the knowledge of the team and the team members. And then what you want to do is look to the future. Because another problem we have, both as individuals and teams, is that we don't know what it is that we need to improve. We need to have some focus. If we're going to get better, remember that's the ultimate goal, is becoming more effective. If we're really going to do that, you've got to have some concrete action plan that says, here's what we're going to do over the next iteration, release, project, whatever it is, or on your own life, here's what I'm going to do over the next week or the next month or the next year, some concrete set of actions that says, here's how I'm going to be more effective. So that's the purpose of the retrospective, is the examination of the experience and then a determination of what it is. And this should be very precise and not too long a list. In fact, what we know about your brains and this is not just you, you, but this is you, us, as humans, is we don't do well with more than three things. So for those of you who are in that influence and thinking tutorial that I had on the first day, we spent some time on that. You can't handle more than three things. That's another mistake I see in a lot of teams, is they get going in those retrospectives, and they start looking at what happened, and they lay out a huge list of things, and then, and I don't know whether this is boring or not, but nothing happens. Because we don't look at it. You don't look at it. You don't do anything with it. It's just a bunch of stuff that nobody pays any attention to. So you have to limit the focus for that output, that action plan from the retrospective, or nothing will happen. And if nothing happens, then after a while people lose faith in the ritual. They say it's just a waste of time. We did it last iteration. Nothing happened. The iteration before that, nothing happened. And it's either because too much time was spent on problems or whinging or an enormous amount of material came out that nobody cared about, there was no ownership, too much, and so nothing happened. She's still here, so I suppose that's good. <laughs> There's another purpose for retrospectives, and I don't know whether this will fit your culture or not. So I'll run it, and we'll see what happens. The very first time I did a retrospective, it was at a telecom company where I was working, and I was the patterns guru. Wow, back in the mid-90s. And we had a little project that was kind of innovative and new, and everybody in the company was excited about it. It's called the Ventures Project. 
And somehow along the way, the Ventures Project got behind. Now, I don't know what happens in India, but in the United States, when projects get behind, what do managers do? Fire. Yeah, well, yes, they breathe fire as well, but they add some more people. Yeah. Anyone here know Brooks Law? Yes, somebody tell me what it is. Yes, if you add people to a project that is late, you will make the project later. Now, when was the Mythical Man Month written? 1917. It's over 25 years old. It's had a silver anniversary edition. <laughs> you would think that by now we would have absorbed some of that information, would you not? Why do managers continue to do that? I have sampled manager responses on that, so I can tell you what I have learned. But what do you think? Why do they do that? Well, yes, it's quick. It's quick and easy. And, well, here are some things I have heard, that if they don't, then their bosses will say, did you add more people? <laughs> because their managers have not read the Mythical Man Month either. Now, here is the corollary to Brooks' law. If you add people to a late project, you will make it later. And if you add enough people, you will bring that project to a screeching halt, and it will never make any forward progress. The end. So this little ventures project started out with six, six people. And they started to fall behind. So one manager said, we better add more people. So they did. And then another manager got a hold of it and said, well, I think we need to even add more people. So that over the period of two weeks, that team grew from six to 70. Seven zero, 70 over two weeks. It ran for about two and a half years. Cost the company $10 million, and that's when a dollar was really worth something. <laughs> That project produced nothing. How could that happen? So my boss came to me and he said, Linda, I would like you to go in there and see if there are some patterns because we don't want to do this again. Go talk to those, those guys over there and see if you can figure that out. I had no idea how to do that. Luckily, my friend Norm Kurth was writing a book about retrospectives. And he was also a patterns guy, and he said, Linda, here's what you do. And he outlined for me some techniques for running a retrospective. And one of them was a timeline. So I did. I, I ran some of those little techniques. And in, that included a timeline. Well, what's a timeline? It's a, a wall or a floor that's devoted to the collection of cards that are written anonymously by people on the project. <coughs> the timeline is a reflection of the time. So in the beginning, the cards are about, say, the first week or the first month or the first quarter, followed by the next, and the next, and the next. So the timeline is divided up, and then people on the team pick up a card, 
and write about how they were feeling about something that happened. And depending upon how they were feeling, they pick a different color. If they were happy, they wrote it on a blue card. If they were surprised, they wrote it on a yellow card. Challenged, green. Red. Angry. Yeah, mad, angry, frustrated. Anonymous. And with certain rules, you can say anything you want. And then you put it on the floor or the wall. And pretty soon what we have is a, a lot of little stories. <coughs> stories about what happened at the beginning and then what happened and then what happened after that and, and how people felt. And I thought, well, this is a kind of a cool exercise. We'll do this. So we had a huge, huge section of the wall, and we had some tape, and, and they came along, and they wrote cards, and they put them on the wall, and I gave them a certain amount of time, and I thought, well, they'll write the cards, and then they will sit down. And that's not what happened at all. In Washington, D.C., there is a memorial for the Vietnam War. I don't know if you've ever been there. She has. Yeah. It's right in the middle of the city. Vietnam was my war, I guess. My brother served. Most of my friends from college served. So it, it's the war I was most familiar with growing up. And so they had a huge wall in Washington, D.C. that was just simply the names of all the people who died in Vietnam. It's just one name after another. And it's in a very busy part of the city, and around it is the chaos and the noise of Washington, D.C., but as you go closer to the wall, it gets very, very quiet. And you see people gathered in small groups, and they're standing in front of a particular part of the wall where there's a name of somebody they knew. And they'll stand and they'll, they'll touch that name. And they'll remember. They'll have a little conversation among themselves. That's what happened here. <laughs> I thought it was one of the scariest things I have ever seen. <laughs> I am not a psychologist, and I was totally unprepared. But that's exactly what these guys did. Now, this project was canceled finally after two and a half years, but I forgot to tell you then it was canceled right after Christmas. <laughs> what were those people doing over Christmas? How much were they working? How many hours a week, do you think? Yeah, usually 60 to 80. Did they take time off for holidays? Uh -huh. How long had it been since they'd had a vacation of any kind? Just like those Vietnam War veterans, they stood in front of cards. They touched the cards. They stood and had little conversations. I had the wisdom to get out of the way. I just sat in the corner and I waited. And after a while, they did sit down. And I thought, maybe that was a good thing. That if we hadn't done that, if we hadn't had this chance to talk about it, to get it out, to write all those red cards. 
So I was really happy to see this. Research shows that when organizations go through changes, and this was certainly a big upheaval, people have feelings and thoughts, but no place to go. We don't talk about that. We don't bring up in the normal course of business those things that were bothering all the people on that project, those 70 guys and what they were going through, having given two and a half years of their lives for nothing. And they knew it. So what happens? No place to go. So their experience is carried forward as a heaviness, a weight. They take it with them to the next project and the next project. No place to put it down. So in a retrospective, especially a retrospective of a project like this, is a time when people can talk about what they were feeling. I have run retrospectives for companies where I was walking the timeline and I saw a card that said, my father died. I got a divorce. My son had a serious accident and is in the hospital. Horrible, horrible news that no one knew about. They didn't talk about it. And when everyone else on the team saw that card, which is anonymous, by the way, they were very upset. They, Who is this? Well, maybe that doesn't happen in India. Maybe you do talk about it. But if not, it's called closure. You need a way to reach closure, especially on really horrible experiences like this one. This is not the timeline, by the way. I'll tell you what this actually is, but this is an example of a timeline. So before going through that, I would never have thought about it. And maybe you haven't either. This was in the period when I was still that really hard-nosed technical person who was a designer and thought I could solve every problem by technical means. And I didn't even understand what was going on here. But now that's how I run retrospectives around letting people have a chance to put that experience down. It's liberating to write that red card and put it on the wall most recently, a project in Korea. I saw things there that were unbelievable. Cards that came spilling out of people I could hardly keep from crying. Thought they've been having this as part of their makeup for how long? And now, finally, they get a chance to get it out. Doesn't mean we're going to solve all these problems, but it is so liberating to just put the card on the wall. That's definitely a part of retrospectives. Yes, sir. Ah. On the timeline, yes, because a lot of people will not say things like that in front of others. And there's another reason for that, too, and we'll come around to it. But this way, you're, there's also a sense of freedom. Now, I know in some organizations, they might do handwriting analysis. <laughs> but there are rules for what you can say. So we do have to be careful. But as long as we follow those rules, you can say just about anything you want. And if it were not anonymous, you wouldn't have that freedom. Yeah, so I think the an anonymity is critical. Yeah. So retrospectives came from the military. 
And if you don't do retrospectives or if you need some justification, there's a great article in Harvard Business Review that talks about how they do it in the military. And in fact, almost everything we have in organizations today comes from the military. Did you know that? Models for contemporary organizations are based on military, a military structure. It's the oldest structure on the face of the earth. Sorry? Yes, that it did. Everything came from the military. Who is this guy? <laughs> we also do it for any kind of safety critical, firefighters, emergency operators. They all have some form of the sort of retrospective or post-mortem. Here's a link to a, a sample for firefighters. And then I know you don't have time to read all the books out there, but this is a great one. It's called The CEO and the Monk. Does that translate? Do you know what a monk is? Yep. yep. Okay. So this is about a company that hired a monk. And the reason why they hired the monk was they said, we're getting ready to have a merger. Two big companies were coming together. And one of the companies was sort of going to take over the other one. So it was as though the other company was going to die. So they had the idea of having a funeral. <laughs> and if you're going to really do it right, you need to have a monk. So they did. The monk came in, and he had his robes on. Hey, hey, smoke, hey. And there was a big urn, and people wrote little notes about the company, and they put it in the urn, and they burned all of the notes. It made people feel better. It truly did. They felt a sense of closure. They could talk about the experiences with the old company, how they were going to miss it. It was definitely a good thing. It worked so well that the CEO decided to keep the monk around. <laughs> you never know when you might need a monk. I think companies should have monks around just in case. And for this particular company, it turned out to be a very good thing. <laughs> it was unfortunate. This is a company that sat right across from the World Trade Center. And on 9-11, People were standing in front of windows and watched as two planes destroyed that building. So as you could imagine, the monk was very busy that day. <laughs> you never know. It's important to think about ritual why? We're hardwired. We have been doing rituals of various kinds as long as we have been human. We have funerals. We have ceremonies. We, we lost it. I did a retrospective recently in Finland, and their ritual is around the sauna. And the CEO said, we're going to start doing saunas. We used to do them. It was a good thing. So you have to find what works in your culture. Bring in a sauna, bring in a monk, whatever works. So here are the rules. I have mentioned Norm Kerr's Prime Directive, but here's what it says. No matter what we learn, no matter what comes up in the way of evidence on the timeline, or in any of the other exercise. No matter what we learn, we are going to assume, at least for the sake of the retrospective, for that short duration, we are going to say to ourselves, I believe that everyone on the project 
was doing the best job he or she could. Now, of course, we know more now. We know that if we could do it over again, we would probably do a better job simply because of what we have learned in the interim. But at the time, given what we knew, given our skills and abilities, we were doing the best job we could. And that applies to anyone that interacts with the team. That has to be a basic assumption. If you're going to write a card about how you felt, it cannot call into question anyone's contribution. You can talk about anything that happened, any event. For instance, suppose you had some problems with the database. And on your project, suppose there was only one person responsible for the database. Do you suppose it makes any difference whether you say, whoa, we had a lot of problems with that database? Or if you say, you know, I'm going to call him Fred. I'm sorry. I hope there are no Freds in the room. You know, Fred really screwed things up for us. I had no end of trouble. Could it make a difference whether you mention someone's name? Because everyone knows that Fred was responsible. He was the database guy. Would it make any difference? Is this just game playing to say you can't say Fred? You can talk about the problem, but you can't call into question anyone's contribution, and you can't lay blame. You can praise Fred all you want, but you can't say, Fred is an idiot. How did we get stuck with this guy? Those are the rules. And you can't do that for anybody else on the team or anybody you interact with. You can't say, those marketing people. So you can talk about events or problems, but you can't point your finger or mention by name blaming another person or another team. Not allowed. You can't write it on a card. You can't say it in an exercise. You can't put it on a flip chart. Whatever the exercises are you're doing in the retrospective, not allowed. No blaming. No naming. Do you follow that? Yes. Very good. That is the first requirement. In fact, when you begin your retrospective, that should be on the wall. And if you forget at any time, it's the job of the rest of the team to say, remember, we have all agreed to follow the prime directive. That's usually enough to call people back from the blaming game and getting caught up in who's responsible for whatever the problem was. So we know this takes time because we don't do a good job of remembering from experience and one of the problems we really have is that there's a myth we all subscribe to that, yeah, but you know, if it was a really bad event like this project that ran for two and a half years, we'll never forget it. Just like 9-11, we'll never forget it. That's going to be emblazoned in our memories forever. So there was a very famous experiment done after the Challenger explosion. Was that something that you heard about? Yeah, okay. The Challenger blew up, and everybody at the time says, I'll never forget what I was doing when the Challenger blew up. Yes? So where do you derive accountability? Sorry? Where do you derive accountability? It's not in here. That's not the job of the team to say, you're responsible. Whose job is that? It's your manager's job, I suppose. 
And the, the, the question that would come up is, does the manager come to the retrospective? This is not about a performance review. That's something yet again. That's very different. If you're running performance reviews in the retrospective, no wonder they're having problems. <laughs> What's the purpose of a retrospective? What's the purpose of a retrospective? Learning, learning, tuning, adjusting, becoming more effective. That's why you hold a retrospective. It's not about accountability or blaming or saying what went wrong and whose fault is it. It's about how can this team be better. You have other things in your companies, I'm sure, about evaluation and performance reviews and who's accountable for what and who's really doing their job and not. But that's not what goes on here. Absolutely not. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. What time is it? Okay. I'm going to, I'll just skip this. Okay. I'll skip that. Here are the questions you ask. The first one is, well, let's go back and look at all those things that really worked well for us. That's that question most people ask. The second question is what? The second question is not, what are all the things that went wrong? So remember we talked at one time that said, you know, that's something that happens in retrospectives is that people get hung up on problems. There's no opportunity here for that. The question is not what went wrong. We don't even ask that. We want to know about everything that worked really well that we don't want to forget. And the second question is, what should we do differently? There's a big difference between the material that's elicited by what should we do differently and the question, what are the things that went wrong? Remember, the goal of a retrospective is to improve, be more effective. It doesn't have anything to do with solving all your problems. For one thing, you can't solve all your problems. I'm sorry. You often don't have the authority or control over many of the things that have caused your problems. But there are always things that you can do differently. So what really worked well? Focus on that. What should you do differently? What did you learn? What still puzzles you? I'm going to start moving here. Sometimes these are questions. Keep, change, puzzles. So here's what should happen in an Agile project is that as you focus on each iteration, what worked well and what should we do differently, those are all about small experiments. And in fact, in each iteration, that's what you should do. No more than three. In every iteration, you should be performing a real experiment. What should we do differently? That is the experiment. And when you do the retrospective and ask those questions, the questions are about the experiments. And on the basis of the answers to those questions, then you decide what the next set of experiments will be. And for agile projects, that's the rhythm of retrospective iteration retrospective iteration. Iterations are about experiments. So in the last iteration, we had, say, two experiments that we were going to try. Now we're going to ask, what worked well about those experiments? What did we learn so that we can do something differently based on our experiments? 
So we had the comment earlier that nothing ever happens as a result of retrospectives. What happens now is you're going to do an experiment. That's what's going to happen. And then when you do the next retrospective, it's about looking at those experiments. And that's what it is. It's experiment. Exa in fact, that's the only way you can do a real experiment is to examine the outcome. And the experiment should be something that you can measure and that you can quantify so that when you get to the end, you can say, yes, the experiment worked, but we learned this, so now we're going to try something else. A small change. So what you're doing is tuning and adjusting and experimenting all the time. And that's what you should do with your life. At the end of every day, at the end of every week, how did my last experiment work? Well, this worked pretty well, but I think I will do this differently in the next day, week, month, year. You see the difference? So you're not starting from scratch. You're not saying, well, all right, well, what worked well? No, it's what worked well about those experiments that we decided to do in the last iteration. What do we want to do differently this time? Tweak some of those experiments? Maybe try a new experiment? And they should be little, and you should never have more than three of them in an iteration. We're supposed to be ending now, aren't we? Yeah. And, and I, I wanted you to have a chance to come up and look at the timeline, so I want to do that. Got okay, one question. Yes? For a two-week iteration? 15, 20 minutes. And when you go into the retrospective, you'll already have the timeline. It's already done. Because you're going to build it in real time. You're going to start it on day one of your iteration. And as things happen, you're going to put cards on the wall. And every day, everybody's going to read those cards. And on your way to the retrospective, you're going to walk through that timeline and say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And in fact, when you walk in the room, you've already got your ideas for the next set of experiments. It depends on the length of the sprint, absolutely. So if you're doing 30 days, I would take a little bit longer. But most people are doing two weeks, and the teams that I coach get by with 15 to 20 minutes. And it's just, hey, what worked well with those experiments? What are we going to do the next time? And most people walk in with ideas for experiments, and it's, our, it's a done deal. They've been talking about it for two weeks. Do you, do you invite uh, outsiders, uh, like project sponsors or business? I would ask the team. For some teams, they're okay with having managers or executives or the business people or outsiders from the team, they're fine with that. Others, no. So it depends on, it depends on the team. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm running up against my time limit and I want to make sure that you have, if you've never seen a timeline, you should be doing it. And on an Agile project, you build it in real time. So if you can come on by, thank you.